Guys, let's turn to uh, page 16 in your packets. So more verifying. And now we have additional identities to learn about. <laughs> so um, we have uh, today and tomorrow. Yes. Today and tomorrow to um, learn about additional identities. Today we're going to talk about some and different identities, and then tomorrow uh, we'll talk about double angle uh, identities. And then uh, Friday we'll get a chance to start reviewing. Monday review, and then test next Tuesday. Okay. Test on Tuesday. Uh, huh? Yeah, test. Test Tuesday. So uh, I hope to get back your partner quizzes on Friday so that uh, we can maybe go over that as well. And, um, uh, and then we can. Um, yeah, use that to help prepare us for uh, Tuesday's test as well. OK, so here's um, the identities we're going to be working with today. Okay. The first is sum. Uh, this is a sign, sum and difference ident identity. Okay, there's no need to memorize this, but you definitely know how to use it. Okay, this is what it says. It says that if I have sine of a plus b and a plus b being angles, I can if I can split that up into sine of a times cosine of b plus cosine of a sine of b. Okay. You just have to. Recognize each of the pieces and okay, insert them in. Uh, if I have a sine of a minus b, then I'll have sine a cosine b minus. So the plus or minus just indicates that depending on what sign you get, you'll uh, use the sign that's appropriate. So if it's plus, then you use plus. If it's minus, you use minus. Okay. There's also the cosine identity. So cosine of a plus b is cosine of a, cosine of b. But you see how the minus and plus are kind of flip-flop, looks kind of strange here. That means that if I have cosine of a plus b, the formula I'll be using is going to be cosine of a, cosine of b minus sine a, sine b. If the formula, if the problem shows me a minus b, then I'm going to do a plus. Do you guys see that? How like the formula shows a minus plus, so it's matching with whichever form you get. Okay. Do you guys see that? Here, the sign is going to be the same signs, but with cosine, you're going to be using the opposite sign to get the formula. Okay. Okay. Let me show you a couple of examples here. Example, uh, problem number one, use some or difference identities to find the exact value. So one thing that uh, we're going to use is the fact that uh, we're going to try to force this into special angles. What I mean by special angles is 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, right? Those are uh, unit circle values we know how to find. 75 is not going to be a nice and pretty value, but Maybe we can represent 75 in terms of a combination of 30, 45, or 60. So what can we think of 75 as? 45 and 30. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this. This is the same thing as um, cosine of 30 plus 45. Okay. So I haven't changed anything. I've just kind of split them up in 
angles that's easier to work with than 75, right? We're trying to do all this without a calculator. Right. Okay, so if you look, this fits nicely with our cosine rule, right? Let's think of 30 as our A value and our 45 as our B value. So we're just going to carefully insert into the formula just as we see it. Okay, so what do we have first? Cosine of 30 times cosine of 45. What's the sign going to be? Good. The angle, the, the, uh, the, is showing a plus between the two angles, so we need to use a minus because of the fact that we're going to take the top with the top. Okay, so minus. Next. Sine of 30. Yeah, just have to go slow through this here. And then sine of 45. Yes. Why did you choose 30? Because we because we know 30 and 45 well. We don't know 75 well, so we're always going to be using numbers that. Um, that we know well, so we're always going to be doing using angles that's on the unit circle okay. to create something that that uh, may not be as accessible. You got like an angle. You know, like those Exactly right. If I if I give you a problem, it'll always be something that you can either add or subtract from angles on the unit circle. Right. Those angles are like 30, 60. Uh, those are the main ones. We may have to deal with second quadrant ones, but if you just know your 30, 45, 60, you're good. But let's re let's review that, right? Maybe it's been a while since we've thought about unit circle. So I'm gonna put this to the side here. Unit circle. If you recall, you got 60 degree here, 45, and 30 degree here. Right? Order pairs. All your order pairs are divided by two. And we start at the upper left corner and we work our way down. So one, two, three. One, two, three. Remember that? Okay. Put the square root over everything. Remember the first number is related to what? Sine or cosine? First number is cosine. The second number is sine. And then tangent would just be y over x covering the um, the x value, uh, covering the denominator, right? So let's see if we can fill this in here. Cosine of 30 is. Yeah, square three over two. Cosine of 45 is. Yeah, root two over two. Minus sine of 30. Uh-huh. Sine of 45. Or two over two. Okay, everybody okay so far? Okay, so now we're just going to put those together, try to get it down to a number. So we have, we can multiply this together. Root three times root two is root six. Root six over four. And here we have root two over four. Common denominator means we can put the, put all that under one fraction, but careful, root six minus root two is not gonna be root four, okay? It's not gonna come out nicely. So the best we can do is just put them next to each other. It'll be some decimal value, but at least we have an exact value for cosine of 75. And we're involving some and different identities forcing that 75 into angles that we recognize 
and then building it from there. OK, any questions there? OK, let's look at number two. Number two, are 40 degrees and 20 degrees, are they easy? OK, so those are not angles we want to be working with. However, maybe I can put this together. Imagine you're starting on the right side and forcing it into the left side. Maybe after we get it into one of the forms, it'll turn into something that we recognize. So which one does this match better with? The sine sum or dif sum and difference or the cosine sum and difference? The sine, OK? A plus. It's going to be the same thing as the plus. So what's my what's my a value? A is 40. B is 20. So we know that this can be turned into sine of a plus b. A being the 40. And b being the 20. So this works out nicely, right? Because I can put this into this form. A plus b 40 plus 20, which is 60. And now all we need to do is to figure out what sine of 60 is. Okay, everybody see that relationship? Okay, so now sine of 60 is equal to what? Over 3 over 2. Moving on to number one, use some more difference identities to verify the following. So the same idea like what we did on the previous identities, verifying where we're just working on the left side and we're just trying to get that left side to clean up in a way that will eventually match the right side. Okay, so we're gonna take advantage of our sum and difference identities. Sine of X minus Y fits nicely with this. Think of your X as your A, think of your Y as your B, and we're just gonna build out the right side. Okay, everybody okay with sine of X minus Y? Okay. We'll keep going. Sine of X plus Y. I'm just going back and forth between my identity and make sure that everything is put in its right place following the formula. Okay. Everybody okay so far? All right, let's take a look a little bit closer. Anything that matches or can be combined? Okay. How about the other two? Add them together. So that gives me. Yeah. Am I done? Yes, that matches the right side. Well, um, the sine X cosine Y is stuck together, so that's one term. So I have one of those, I have another one of those, I put them together, I have two of those. Now if it was sine x plus cosine y, sine x plus cosine y, then we will need two sine x and plus two cosine y. But we need to think of sine x and cosine y as just one thing. And we have two of those at the end. Okay. Can you guys try number two? Same idea, look at the formula and see if we can expand out the left side and then combine like terms and it should match that right side. Okay, try number two.
careful. What's going to be the sign as I build it as I build this out? It's going to be a plus. Yeah, good. Positive, right? You look at cosine is going to be a little bit flip flop there. And the signs will be a little bit opposite because of the way the formula is constructed. Do these clean up nicely? Yeah. Signs goes away, cosines adds together. Yep. So why would the um, cosine and cosine law? Why would that be a plus sign? The reason why is because if you look at the formula here, we're dealing with cosine of a minus b which means that we got to take the sign that is shown below. So if it's a plus, then we will, we'll, we'll find, we'll um, match it with the upper sign. Uh, but the sign, the one on the left is, um, those are matching perfectly. If I see plus, I'll use plus. If I see minus, I'll use minus. But yeah, cosines is, is opposite. So that, that notation tells us it's opposite. Okay. Combine like terms, we get two cosine x cosine y. Four point oh eight practice number three. Um, there's a formula sheet that is uh, on the back of your calendar. If you misplace your calendar, um, I also put it at the very back page of your packet. So if you look, there is a special sum and difference for tangents. And the property says this, it says that if I have tangent of A plus B, the top is going to match the sign as I see in the problem, but the bottom is gonna be opposite. So um, we just have to be careful with, uh, with the form here. Okay, so let's try number three. We'll build both of the tangent of X plus Y out using the formula. So let me write the let me write the formula above so we can have easy access to it. Okay, so we'll start with the plus. So the top is going to match the sign, but the bottom is going to be different. Okay, so that completes the first expansion of tangent of x plus y. Are we okay with that? Okay, moving on to tangent of x minus y. Same formula, just the signs will be a little bit different. Okay, 
Are we good so far? All right, look at the right side. Looks at the right side is going to be a bunch of, uh, it's going to be all combined into one term. There's no need for common denominators. We're not adding, we're multiplying. So which is multiply across, right? Which we'll is full everything out from left to right and see where that takes us. Looks like we have a difference of squares there, so we can either fold everything out or just understand that the middle terms will just cancel out nicely because the signs will be different. All those middle terms goes away and we should get a nice clean match with the right side. Questions? Okay, let's skip number four for now. Four is a little messy. We'll come back to it later. Okay, right, let's turn to page 17. And let's look at number five. Okay, so still need to look at number three. Okay. So number five, uh, we see definitely an opportunity for us to expand the sine of A minus B and cosine of A minus B. We also see that these are two fractions, so what do you think eventually we need to do? Cobs on there, especially that right side is showing one, one fraction. Right? So we definitely know ultimately we have to push those two fractions together, so we'll have to find common denominator. But first things first, let's expand that numerator first, and then we can build in the common denominator portion. Okay. Here, I'll put the formula right above so you guys can see it. Let's see if we can build out. Everybody okay with that numerator expansion? Okay. All right, common denominator. What's our common denominator? Sign B, go sign B. Okay. Okay. 
OK, it's going to feel a little messy, but things will clean up nicely. Just have to bear with it a little bit. The first fraction is missing a cosine B, so I need to multiply everything through by cosine B. Um, the second fraction is missing a sine B, so I need to distribute a sine B through. Okay, so first, uh, if I distribute the cosine through the first fraction, I get sine A cosine squared B, because cosine squared B will combine nicely, right? Minus, okay, this feels, feels a little weird here, because you got cosine B, cosine A, and sine B, so there's gonna be three things there. Cosine B, cosine A, sine B, but it'll eventually go away. Three things, because we don't have any matching. Okay, next up, distribute the sine B through. So that's another three things there. Sine B, cosine A, cosine B. Okay. Distribute the sine B through this parentheses. Okay, so now there's a pair there. Sine A times sine squared B. Okay, we know we can push all this under one fraction. Do you see any like terms that works out nicely? Thankfully this, right? Cosine B, cosine A, sine D. We can get these to go away. Okay, let's see what we have left. OK, we're trying to get it all the way down to sine A over sine B cosine B. Uh, getting pretty close there. What can we do with the numerator? Uh, let's not go that far yet. You see anything with the two terms here? What can we do? Take out. Yeah, let's take out GCF, right? Maybe that pulling out that, that GCF maybe can um, amount to something, hopefully, an identity. Okay, do we have more clarity here? Right. What's well, cosine squared plus sine squared? One. Sine A times one is just sine A. Oh, that's true. Yeah, as long as are you talking about these angles here? Yeah. Yeah, as long as they're the same, that's that's all we need. If there could be could be cosine squared a plus sine squared a, cosine squared c plus cosine squared c, as long as they're the same and they're both square, they're added together. That's equal to one. Okay. Okay. Uh, the rest of the page six through eleven are more um, review from 
previous topics. So um, let's look at number six. Cosine squared minus sine squared equals one minus two sine squared. We don't have to involve sum or difference of um, identity here. We can rely on the older identities that we've seen, the, the Pythagorean identities. Okay. So we recognize this as something um, doesn't quite fit into identity, but then you look at the right side, the right side is all in terms of sine. So we let's just find a way to replace cosine squared. Mm -hmm. Cosine squared can turn into, yeah. All right, that's just a rearranging of our Pythagorean identity. And now let's see if that'll take us somewhere. One minus sine squared minus sine squared. Those are two like terms. We have one minus two sine squared. So there's our answer. Okay, number seven. We know that there's a special uh, um, shift. This is representing some uh, identity here, right? What's uh, tangent to the power of two minus x? Yeah, tangent and cotangent has that shifted relationship there. Just look on your identity sheets. Okay, what would you do next? Make it easier to see the connection between cotangent and secant. Yeah, everything in terms of sine and cosine, right? Even though the right side is showing cosecant, we know we're, we'll have an easier time matching the parts if everything's in terms of sine and cosine. Cosine goes away nicely. We're left with one over sine, which is cosecant. Okay, number eight is a review of even and odd functions. Secant is even or odd. Even, so that negative just goes away. Cosecant, however, is yeah, odd, so negative. Yeah, everything in terms of sine and cosine, and we're hopefully we can get a tangent to show up. We got a fraction over a fraction. Let's just bring that denominator up as a reciprocal. Negative sine over cosine. And that matches with tangent or negative tangent. Number nine, same start as number eight. Let's resolve those negative thetas there. Cosine of theta turns into what? Yeah, just cosine, right? Even function, that negative has no impact. What about the sine? Negative. Sine is odd. Okay, we're trying to get this to turn into secant plus tangent. We really can't, really can't um, split this up into individual fractions. There's no common denominator. There's no trick function to turn back into. So we really need to depend on, on an identity. So how can I force an identity into this problem? Yeah, multiply both by cosine. 
just to get something started, right? Because we don't see the end yet, but we know that we're kind of stuck at a place where um, we really need some identity to kind of help us um, kind of jumpstart our our, um, our progress. Okay, I'll multiply across cosine times cosine is cosine squared. My denominator, I'm going to leave that alone. I don't want to, I don't want to um, combine them just yet because maybe there's something um, that can be helpful leaving them separate. Okay. What can I do with that cosine square now that it's an identity? Mm -hmm. Turn to one. Yeah. Okay. At least we see some similarities now between numerator and denominator. That's a good sign. Is there anything more that I can do to make the numerator and denominator look even more alike? Yeah, this, I know they're similar, but we can't quite cancel these out. We got to do something else. That minus is preventing us, right? So is there anything else that I can do to make this look like this? Factor. Difference of what? Difference of squares. Yep. A squared minus B squared is equal to A minus B times A plus B. Cancel, cancel. OK, any ideas from here? Break it up, good. I couldn't break up before. I couldn't break before because I had too many terms in the denominator, but now there's only one term in the denominator. I can break it up and hopefully one will match with secant and the other will match with tangent. One over cosine is the same thing as sine over cosine, the same thing as tangent. Good. Good. All right, let's do two more and we'll be done. OK, number 10. 2 plus cosine squared minus 3 cosine to the fourth. Does that remind you of look similar to what we can do here? This is factoring. It's a trinomial factoring problem. OK, but let's just deal in terms of X just to make things very familiar. We'll factor in terms of x and then we'll just bring in the cosine. Okay. So let's think of think of this in terms of this problem here. Negative 3x to the fourth plus x squared plus 2. Okay. See that resemblance there? If we can just factor that problem, we can bring in the cosine when we're done with that. But we don't like having a negative for our first term, so I'm going to factor a negative one out and make it 3x to the fourth minus x squared minus 2. OK, we ask ourselves what multiplies to be negative 6 and adds it to be negative 1. In fact, if you want to think of it as this problem instead, maybe that's even easier. And then just bring in that three later. Just multiply that, put that three with a two, and this becomes an easier problem. Multiply to be negative six, adds it to be negative one, negative three, and positive two, right? So careful though, that's the x to the fourth, so we got to break it down into x squared and x squared. And we move that we move that three, so we have to bring it back so we don't lose track. Okay. 
reduce, and then bring in front. Okay, we spent the time to go through our factoring process. Now let's bring it back in terms of cosine because we're forcing an easier problem there to make it um, more familiar. Now let's bring it back. OK, you see any leads? Yeah, there's something special here. What can we do there? Say it again. Mm, OK, let's see. So one, yeah, I can multiply negative through it. That's fine. So if I multiply negative through, I get negative cosine squared plus one, or same thing as one minus cosine squared. And one minus cosine squared is the same thing as sine squared. Okay, are we at the end? Okay. Okay, try number 11. It should be a little bit easier. The factoring is not as messy, but try number 11 and I'll follow up in a few minutes. Multiply to be one, adds up to be negative two. Negative one and negative one, right? Good. So we get x squared minus one, x squared minus one. Bring in the cosecant squared. And then we should have a nice identity that we can use. Any questions here? Okay, leave your packets out. I'm just going to check page 16 and 17. Thank you. 